Okay, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and good morning everyone. Uh, it's me again. Yeah, uh, my name is Zainal. Uh, I'm from the School of Chemical and Energy Engineering uh, from the Faculty of Engineering University of Malaysia, Johor Bahru. And today, Alhamdulillah, we are meeting everybody again for the next series of Distinguished Lecture Series, uh, which has been organized by our Faculty of Engineering. So today we are very happy to welcome and we are also very grateful to have him with us, our one of our uh, collaborators from across the what do I say Pacific Ocean, right? From all the way from Argentina. Yeah. His name is Professor Guillermo Raul Castro. Um, he's now working in uh, Sindefi and also University of La Plata in Argentina. So uh, maybe a little bit of a background. How does uh, how did this collabor uh, co collaboration started? Uh, we are actually under this program called uh, uh, CONISAT R&D bilateral program uh, 2015 to 2018, uh, which was uh, participated by uh, three institutions from Argentina and also UTM. So we have five projects in there. So Professor Castro was the uh, one was a project leader for one of the projects, and he was uh, uh, carry out his project with our uh, project leader here which is uh, Professor Madia, uh, Associate Professor Dr. Azila Binti Aziz, uh, who was previously working in uh, School of Chemical Energy Engineering, but now she is based in uh, Malaysian uh, Japan Institute of Industrial Technology, MJIT, UTMKL. So they were working on one project, which uh, I'm happy to say that it is uh, progressing really well. So uh, besides that, uh, Professor Castro was also uh, here in our campus. However, he was in, in Kuala Lumpur, just now UTMKL. Uh, as a visiting uh, visiting researcher in uh, late 2017 yeah so uh, we were uh, quite uh, and very happy that uh, uh, to, to 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 see that this uh, uh, collaboration uh, will continue uh, in, in 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 the future yeah uh, without further uh, uh, without taking up further much time i think i would uh, pass the uh, session to our uh, distinguished team uh, Professor Rafiq to introduce our distinguished speaker today. Over to you, Prof. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Zainal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, and uh, welcome everyone to our 38th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Mohamad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor William Raul Castro from National University of La Plata, Argentina. A bit about our presenter today. William Raul Castro received his MSc and PhD in Chemistry from the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and spent two years in 1996 to 1998 as a postdoc at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Cambridge, USA and Tufts University, Boston, US. He was later appointed as adjunct professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering, Tufts University, Boston, from 2001 to 2006. His current position is the Director of Nanobiomaterials Lab, Institute of Applied Biotechnology, Sindefi La Plata, Argentina, top scientist, National Research Council, CONICET, Argentina. He is also a full professor in the biotech area Department of Chemistry, School of Sciences, National University of La Plata, Argentina. His scientific production include five patents, more than 180 papers and book chapters. His area of interest include nanobiotechnology, biopolymers, biocatalysis, molecular controlled release, tissue engineering, and 3D bioprinting. So that is a brief biography of our speaker. Here now is Professor William Raul Castro from the National University of La Plata, Argentina, with his talk on biomedical applications of bacterial cellulose. Professor Castro, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Rafik. Uh, I, I appreciate the, the, the just taking me into account for these lectures, and it's a pleasure for me to talk to you and, and, and it's uh, really uh, want to, to have a, a good uh, collaboration continue between our groups. So, uh, my presentation of today 
will be related to bacterial cellulose and biomedical applications. So uh, there are two types of uh, cellulose. One is uh, vegetal uh, cellulose, plant cellulose, and the other one is bacterial one. Bacterial one has the advantage of a more crystalline structure. So it means it's more resistant. And in uh, exist this uh, bacterial cellulose for many, many years. So it's a popular food in some countries like a kombucha tea, nata de coco, nata of pineapple, and some Russian tea. So the membrane, this is the membrane of, uh, of uh, bacterial cellulose produced by different bacteria. So the application of uh, bacterial cellulose is abroad in many fields, but in biomedical has the advantage that is a uh, is a uh, uh, a good for tailoring and do many many things just uh, to to take uh, care of burns and and also to in, to make some implants for tissue engineering. So. The production at lab scale is just in Erlen Mayer. And as you can see, the bacterial cellulose is produced in the interface of liquid, which is the media of bacteria, and air. The, the films can be defined by the recipient. And the, the thickness of the, of the bacterial cellulose also can be uh, determined by the time of cultivation. There are some pilot plants that are able to produce this in many ways because they can be used as a skin replacement in the case of born. But also there are some, and this is a, a film, a batch film uh, uh, culture, but also a rotate disc can, can, uh, can be do it with different kind of, uh, of structures. So this is bacteria that are producing the bacterial cellulose. As you can see, this is a scanning electron microscope. You can see the bacteria growing and producing the net. So the mechanism of producing this, uh, this film is just uh, simple. So the bacteria is uh, supplemented with fructose or glucose, just a small uh, carbon source, and they create a, 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 a glucan change that by, by hydrogen bonds, they make single microfiber um, following by ribbons. So this is the structure, and as you can see, this is UDPG involved in the, the export of, uh, of the of the cellulose. So the energetic uh, situation of the bacteria is very, very important. So this is the structure of those, the subfibers, microfibers and fiber blocks. And this is the, uh, a cartoon on how they look like the, the cellulose membranes. This is a scanning electron microscope. As you can see, the network is interconnected and random, of course. So right now we are using Comagata Ibacter Hanseni to produce different kinds of structure of bacterial cellulose. And um, the final product is represented by this cartoon. As you can see, the membrane is asymmetric, means that in the top of the membrane, is in contact with the air, but in the in the bottom there is a, a cells producing the bacterial cellulose, and so these pending chains of uh, beta one fourth glucose are very easy to tailor, and this is one of the big advantage of bacterial cellulose compared to the plant ones. So. What we can do with the bacterial cellulose? We can produce micro and nanoparticles. We can make films, as I show, but also microtubes, hybrid microparticles, and also hybrid films. 
So there are many applications. We can do also micro crystals, nano crystals that can be used for drug delivery or just to make a, an extract film. So in our lab, we work with uh, the, the development of drug delivery devices. So in this case, we want to have a molecular administration, which are in some cases very complicated because the drugs that we choose are really toxic. So we want to, the drug to be stabilized under environmental physiological conditions, so optimized for therapy. Low toxicity is very important. So the range of, of using the drugs should be lower than the therapeutic windows established by, by, by the physicians. Low side effects, which are uh, very important because most of the, of the drugs with uh, uh, chronic use produce low, uh, side effects which are not tolerable. Increase biodisponibility, which is just that the cells, the target, have the drug in time and concentration and decrease the circulating molecular concentrations. So our work is to develop efficient molecular carriers based on self-assembly. We work with biopolymers, different kinds of biopolymers. So we want to have effective cargo target localization, proper release, proper kinetic release, decrease of circulating molecule in the body, and also the carrier and the products of the carrier should be not toxic. So in the case of a bacterial cellulose medical application, there are many, as you can see here, from tissue to optical coatings and sensors, so replacement of a ligament, meniscus, cartilage, blood vessel replace, uh, there are many, many applications. However, the main problem of uh, cellulose is that bacterial cellulose cannot hold the drug for a long time under physiological condition. So in this case, we need to modify, we need to alter this, but how we can do it in the way that uh, uh, without using chemical uh, reagents, because in this case will be more safe, green chemistry, I would say. So this, there are some alternatives. The first presentation will be focused on delivery of levofloxacin. Levofloxacin is, uh, is a third generation fluoroquinolone Fluoroquinolones are used since the 60s, but the main problem of fluoroquinolones is the p stacking. It means that the molecules, when are free, they pile each other and become insoluble. As you can see, x log p3, which is calculated by all uh, uh, groups, the structure of the of the levofloxacin is very low. So Hydrogen donor counts one, acceptor eight, and rotor table two. So it's very complicated. In this case, the disponibility of levofloxacin is very low, and also under physiological condition, they is converted to ciprofloxacin, which it was demonstrated that precipitates in the in the intestine. So this is a, a troublesome. Uh, uh, drug, uh, principally for for chronic diseases. So, but we choose pectin in this case. Why pectin? Pectin is a polygalacturan, which has in some places ester groups. So they can do hydrophobic uh, interactions and they can interact with hydrophobic molecules like levofloxacin to create structures and decrease the release of the drug. 
Also, the advantage of pectin is that um, it's able to make gels in presence of um, calcium in general, but generally bivalent ions. So they make these kind of structures, but well, this is calcium and this is the interaction of the change. So it's a trilaminar change and some kind of hydrophobic points which are not uh, be uh, observed, but the drug can be uh, fit there. So we want to include pectin in, in the culture of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the bacteria. So we make the hydrogel, we, push, we place a pectin and we create an hydrogel and we analyze there with antibacterial activity. But also we want to have some, so if the, the films are used for skin repair or just a skin burn, we need to control uh, that the, 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 the goons are not uh, uh, infected. So we use levofloxacin, but also we can put some, some proteins to induce the healing. And this is was the purpose of uh, of the work. So when we start uh, uh, taking different kind of uh, bacterial cellulose and increase the amount of pectin, we can see that the encapsulated uh, levofloxacin increase with the amount of uh, of the pectin, which is uh, interesting for this point of view, but it's not enough. So this is a structure of bacterial cellulose on, 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 on the left and in the right, bacterial cellulose with pectin. As you can see, the films made by, by pectin inside the structure of the, of the cellulose change the morphology of the gel. So, this is bacterial cellulose um, plus pectin. Um, this is how the, the porosymmetry of, uh, of the gel without uh, pectin and with pectin. And this is the structure of the, of the surface. So as you can see, change radically. So when we make a TGA, tegogrammetric analysis, we can see that the, the, the coacervate of bacterial cellulose pectin is more stable regarding the temperature. So as you can see, the mass loss in the range of 200 to 400 is 30 compared to pectin, which is 51, and cellulose 68. Also the residue is higher at 750 degrees C, which means we stabilize the film. So we check by IR this interaction and we see some shift from pectin and also bacterial cellulose. It means the interaction was confirmed. So the, the, the intimate interaction of the film is important to take care about the release of the of the drug. When we study by IR the interaction of levofloxacin with with a, a pectin, we can see also changes in this in this area. So an amplification of this, as you can see, there are some batochromic and ipsochromic shift from the levo and from pectin. It means the interaction in the carboxylate groups are intense, and which is just interesting for, for the point of view. So as, as you can see, this is RD, so it's X-ray, and the, the crystalline structure of the, of the film, of the combined film, decrease in the mixture, in the coacervate. So, this is good also for, for the structure of, of the gel. 
When we analyze the porosymmetry, this is bacterial cellulose, and you can see the pores are very close to 100,000. But in the, in the coacervate, the switch was very high. So there are some degrees of the porosity of the, of the, of the film, which is also interesting because if the release is, uh, is a free one, it's just following the, 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 the law of, of free release, uh, the decrease of pore size will be helpful just to reduce the, the release. So those are kinetic release from bacterial cellulose and bacterial cellulose pectin. So in this case, as you can see, there are some kind of a decrease. What it means? It means that we can tailor the release of levofloxacin in this range. So changing the concentration of pectin, we can just follow the release according what are the needs of the patient, which is very important. When we analyze the cytotoxicity of the, of the levofloxacin and the pectin with levofloxacin, we can see in all cases, increasing the, the concentration of the, of the quinolone, there are no toxicity at all in the complex. However, with levofloxacin alone, at 200 micrograms per milliliter, the toxicity is in the border. So it's very close to, to toxic effect in Cho1, T1 cells. So next one, we just low albumin because albumin has hydrophobic pockets. It's, it's a protein that can hold just uh, very hydrophobic uh, uh, molecules uh, and particular, particularly uh, uh, peptides. So changing the, the pH in BC and, and in BCH, oh, I'm sorry, and HEP, you can see how, how much we increase the amount of uh, of micrograms per gram of matrix. So it's more than two and a half times. It's huge. So this is another advantage. When we try to use uh, both simultaneously, HSA and pectin, just for, for levofloxacin, we can see also the difference of release of BC and, and uh, BC with a, with a pectin. Also, as you can see, this is the, the release of levofloxacin and compared to the other one, the release is decreasing. So it means that HSA interferes with the release also of uh, levofloxacin, which is also interesting because in this case, we have two parameters to modulate the release of the antibiotic, the concentration of pectin and also the concentration of the HSA. However, in both cases, there are no interference with the antimicrobial activity, which is good because one of the problems that we can think about is the interaction and the, the complex formation between levo and levofloxacin and HSA. So this one, uh, one of the, of the topic. The second one is the administration of the cancer drugs, just using bacterial cellulose. As you can, maybe you know that anti-cancer drugs are in most of the cases terrible for the patient. Chemotherapy start to make some mess with the people. The people lost hair, this movement, coordination, many, many things. So we want to, to have some uh, films containing uh, anti-cancer, one anti-cancer drug, which is one of the most used. And in this case, we choose 
Dr. Uh, Lubisi, which uh, inhibits the activity of toponym summarase 2, but also produces several problems in, in, in the body. One of the main ones is the, the, the formation of pre-oxygen radicals. So it's one of the most used uh, anti-cancer drugs, as you can see the list, and it's not ending with this. So this is more the most uh, typical use of uh, doxorubicin, but there are other many uses in, in different kinds of cancer. However, as you can see, there are many problems, many, many problems, from cardiomyopathy and nauseous vomiting, etc. So it's, it's complicated. So we want to, in some way, previous to the surgery, to implant a film with doxorubicin to just to reduce the film previously to, to go to surgery. So we developed two main strategies in situ modification of bacterial cellulose or ex situ. So in situ will be to place something inside the culture. In this case, it's alginate, which is, which is not degradable by the bacteria. An ex situ modification we use calcium carbonate and solid lipid nanoparticles. So these are complementary strategies. So those are the films. This is native BC plus alginate. As you can see, the network as similar we saw with uh, with pectin, and different amplification of the of the membrane. And you can see very well how the films are expanded because of alginate uh, just uh, uh, crosslinking. The crosslinking of alginate is very straightforward. Um, you can put alginate in presence of calcium and they can create a three-dimensional films. So, analysis of the thermogravimetric analysis, as you can see the difference of, uh, of uh, the individual polymer, cellulose and alginate, and um, the quasi survey too. Um, look at the surface change of the bacterial cellulose and alginate is almost one, one and a half. The pore volume also increased, um, the pore size too. So this is an advantage for, 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 uh, for the, the, the quasarvate with alginate. So we make uh, different kind of uh, studies. We make a screening with pectin, wargam, uh, alginate, carrageenine, so and we got very good result with uh, with to make uh, different kind of structures. As you can see, this is the uh, uh, microsphere containing doxorubicin, which is rare. So when we use different initial concentration to load in the films, as you can see that the the drug release depends on the concentration. It means that we can control how release is at one uh, concentration of, uh, of alginate. Without alginate, the release is total in less than one hour, so it's, it is not working. So this is the drug encapsulated, and these are the kinetic of the, uh, the drug. So, as you can see, uh, it's not clear, but I try to show that the, the release with the increased concentration of encapsulated doxorubicin is linear regarding to release at one concentration of alginate. It means that we can predict how the doxorubicin is released because depends on what we put at one uh, alginate concentration. Uh, ex situ modification can be do it with calcium carbonate, which is a salt that is uh, is straightforward uh, to use it because in acid condition they produce uh, 
carbon dioxide. And kappa carcinogen, which is approved by FDA of the Food and Drug Administration of the United States, and we can place inside solid lipid nanoparticles. These are two different strategies. So kappa carcinogen is sulfated polygalactan, so also hydrophobic, but can make gels with uh, monovalent cations, in most of the cases, potassium. Um, they have a high amount of rotatable bones. It means that the folding of this uh, kappa carcinogen is, uh, is easy. Um, also, they can uh, have a, a 25 hydrogen acceptor counts. It means that interact by hydrogen bond and eight donor hydrogens. So this is the calcium carbonate. And as I mentioned, this is the physiological state. And what happened in presence of cancer? Cancer cells have higher metabolism than normal cells. And the amount of lactic acid produced by, by cancer cell is huge compared to the normal one. It means close to the solid tumors, the pH is low. Where it's low, it's lower is sometimes five to five, five, depends on the type of tumor and location in the body. So what it means that the calcium carbonate will be dissolved when it is not under uh, physiological condition. So we can implant the film containing calcium carbonate with carrageenan and the drug close to the tumors. And the tumor by itself, by acidification, we will destroy the calcium carbonate and release the drug. So, those are particles of calcium carbonate. Calcium carbonate has different kind of uh, 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 structures, and batterite is one of the of the best one. So, and also there are different kind of carrageenans which contains sulfate groups. Um, there are different ways to create uh, a gel. So we decided to use kappa carrageenan because they have a very good control of uh, the battery uh, uh, release. And also they can be cross-linked with just a monovalent cation. So we analyzed the particle size and we found that the, the diameter it was 2.5 micrometers. So those are microparticles of calcium carbonate containing doxorubicin and carrageenan. And we analyze the location of the doxorubicin just in the particles. So this is a PR fluorescent synchrotron light. And we analyze the carrageenan uh, along this. And we found, this is a fluorescent analysis, and we found that the, the Doxorubicin is located along the, the microparticles. Also, we have a, uh, the same analysis in another sample, and we found the same kind of, uh, of, uh, of content, doxorubicin content. <clears throat> when we analyze by fluorescence, we just check that the, 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 the light spot, it means that the presence of uh, doxorubicin, which is red, and also we label with fluorescence uh, uh, carrageenan, and we found that the, the carrageenan was inside the particles too. <clears throat> this is the accumulated release of doxorubicin um, in different conditions without carrageenan and with carrageenan. As you can see, also we can speculate of the amount of the carrageenan to release the the drug. <clears throat> so we want to target the particles. How to target the particles? Well, one of the requirements of cancer cell is folic acid. They 
they have a huge amount of receptors for folic acid because it's essential for cell growth. So we just uh, derivatize folic acid with carrageenine just to, to, to target specifically cancer cells and also load with uh, doxorubicin. We make these uh, gels, three-dimensional gels, and we create these particles. <clears throat> As you can see, when you uh, we analyze osteosarcoma MG63 line, we see that the the the, the viability of uh, of uh, the cells increase with the amount of uh, of uh, folic acid. So this is a real advantage. <clears throat> when we analyze with a confocal microscopy, bacterial cellulose with the particles, we can see how this, uh, this carrageenine and this calcium carbonate particles and the EBIT ones contain doxorubicin, which is just check that the system is working for us. So, what was the next? The next was to create the nanoparticles, the microparticles, sorry, just in the bottom of the bacterial cellulose. So, we nucleate bacterial cellulose with calcium carbonate, hybrid microparticles containing carrageenine and doxorubicin. And we get this. As I mentioned before in one of the first slides, this is a, a, a cross section of the membrane. As you can see, there are no particles in one side, but many in the bottom in this case. If you remember, bacterial cellulose has pendant glucose uh, residues and the particles start growing under this condition, which means that the gel has in one side the microparticles with doxorubicin and the other has not. This is perfect just to make an implant, to make chemical treatment for cancer. So this is, those are the particles, and this is the dox release under different conditions. So, so this is uh, uh, how how the dogs binding the system. As you can see, when this it is hybrid, the 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 doxorubicin binding is higher compared to the other ones. So, when you in, we check the initial stock solution. And in the hybrid systems, you can see when you increase the amount of doxorubicin, the amount of incorporated doxorubicin is higher. So also the release is changing according to the amount of, uh, of the doxorubicin, which is interesting because we can modulate how doxorubicin is released just to place in some way, an amount, on the defined amount, place it on the case, on the tumor diameter and weight. So another thing is that we check the dox release with the pH. So the dox release increases when the pH decreases, as I mentioned before. So those are physiological states, and when they become acid, they start to release toxicity, which is a very good uh, profile compared to the injection of doxorubicin in the body to treat to treat uh, solid tumors. The other strategy of implanting was develop solid lipid nanoparticles. In this case, we play with two different ways. First, doxorubicin equilibrium was based on pH. So there is a change of the proton when 
the pH is 8.5. Um, so become neutral or become acid. So this is an advantage because solid lipids are very hydrophobic. So we analyze uh, doxorubicin and as you can see, this is a TGA and X-ray. So the changes of, uh, of the profile of the nanoparticles based on the pH of doxorubicin. So this is a neutral when, when doxorubicin is neutral, a higher pH, and this is acid when it's a lower pH. So the structure is similar, but the content not. As you can see, acid pH, as it was predicted, is 48 and in neutral condition. So when the, the molecule has, is not protonated, it's twice. Also, the zeta potential, which is the, 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 the charge of the surface of the nanoparticles, changes also. The diameter of particle is, is similar, but the PDI, it means the distribution, also change when, when it's neutral compared to, to acid. <clears throat> so when we study the release, a different pH, 5 and 7.4, so tumor condition or acid condition and physiological condition, you can see the difference of release. And also, what is the neutral, neutral doxorubicin wants to keep more close to, to inside the nanoparticle, but protonated want to be released fast. So we can make a combination of both using MDI MB231 by doxorubicin. As you can see, what is the effect of the, the over, over the cells? And you can see the survival is very low after 16 and 72 hours and 72 hours. When we analyze the internalization, by fluorescence, we can follow inside the cell. You can see the control of doxorubicin, so it takes a lot to be inside the, the, the cell, but when we just put the nanoparticles, the fluorescence increases. So the kinetic of internalization is this one. So for, for the neutral and for the protonated, one is very close to, to doxorubicin, free doxorubicin. And so the combination of both can make uh, a good result for tumor uh, treatment. So those are the cells with nanoparticles. This is with doxorubicin. And this is with doxorubicin just internalizing inside the cells. So. Uh, this is confocal spectral uh, fluorescence analysis. Um, we can see that the nanoparticles are effective for uh, just uh, uh, the tumor treatment. So we analyze the spectra from using the confocal. As you can see, in one hour, there are no particles. At 22 hours, there are particles. This is this, this fluorescence means the nucleus of the cell, and also is confirmed by by uh, taking the values of, uh, of the confocal. So the encapsulation was efficiency was uh, doxorubicin in bacterial cellulose is zero point zero four, but just with the uh, neutral doxorubicin e and solid lipid nanoparticles is, is 0.15 and protonated is just uh, 0.11. So these are scanning electron microscopies of, uh, of the film just with the particles, the nanoparticles inside. And we, we check that this is just bound to the film. So we studied the dox release from the nanoparticles. 
we can see finally this kind of uh, profile. And in this way, the advantage is that we can reduce the amount of doxorubicin loaded to the body because it will be local and it will be controlled regarding the tumor diameter and activity. So in vivo experimental design, we uh, with just make an orthotopic tumor with just injecting a, 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 a mammalian tumor in the mammary fat pad, we can get some, some we just uh, analyze non-treated free doxorubicin and with the nanoparticles and we see some advantages. So this is non-treated and this is free and this is just with the nanoparticles. So the advantage was that we release based on the activity of the tumor, reducing the amount of the toxicity. So bacterial cellulose matrices modified by in situ or in situ simple techniques, self-assembly absorption can be used for tools for sustained and controlled drug delivery in many strategies. So we have many things to do with and bacterial cellulose is a good uh, choice to, to start working with. So I want to thank uh, the organizers, uh, particularly Professor Sainul Zakaria, um, the Dean, Professor Rafik Kadir. Thank you very much. Okay, Guillermo, thank you very much uh, for the very interesting uh, presentation. So I think you can you can uh, stop sharing your slide now. What? What do you like can to you do? Stop, can you stop sharing your slide now? Stop sharing. Yeah, yeah, I just stop it. Okay, so that we can now uh, get a uh, feed for any questions asked from the participants from the online session. Maybe we have some questions from the... Uh, uh, participant, can you read the question? Can you see the question, Gijero? Yeah. yeah. Okay, this is a question from our uh, ex-UTM staff, Professor Afifi. So his question is, uh, will the inclusion of calcium carbonate uh, later added to form stones in the urinary tracts of patients administered with this drug means, will when you add calcium carbonate in your formulations, Will it induce any uh, formation of stones in the urinary tracts of patients? Well, we didn't work with patients, but uh, we work with uh, some rats. Yeah. But the, 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 the situation is that we place the, the film with the calcium carbonate and carrageenan in the top of the tumor. We open by surgery, we place the, the, this film, just regarding the, the, the diameter of the tumor, the location, we can make uh, the structure, the three-dimensional structure, we load with a proper amount of, uh, because you know the, how, how big is the tumor, um, we just define it at Tyler, the amount of calcium carbonate in the film. So, when the tumor starts acidifying the, the, the environment, the calcium carbonate will be totally dissolved. In this case, the structure of bacterial cellulose containing carrageenan will release the drug. And this is the advantage. So it's local delivery. It's not just you know, doxorubicin is just IV. So the people receive doxorubicin in huge amount is around the body. In this case, it depends on the tumor. The tumor, you can, you can do some scanning and you can get the volume of the tumor, the location and how, how they grow. You can, you can define that. In, based on that, we can tailor the film according to the volume, how aggressive is the, the tumor, 
the markers that the, the tumor has and tailor the film properly with the amount of doxorubicin. So there are no uh, calcium carbonate um, around your body because it's in the film and it will be dis totally dissolved. Hopefully. Okay. <laughs> Okay, Guillermo, uh, thank you very much for the answer for that question. Uh, do we have any more questions from the from the participants probably uh, online? Um, well, I guess uh, maybe they're still uh, working on it. So maybe one question from me, Guillermo. Sure. So uh, apart from the strains that you uh, you highlighted just now the bacterial strains in terms of the future development of this uh, area um, can we expect to find uh, other bacterial strain that can produce uh, as uh, that can act as our uh, supplier so-called supplier for this for this area yeah because most of the bacteria that are growing uh, and producing uh, bacterial cellulose I, as, are acetobacter. So they can grow on waste. And this is main advantage because it's a simple bacteria. The metabolism is very, very simple. So um, you can use just uh, any juice extract or any juice waste or just, uh, you know, sugar cane that you are not uh, going to, to be processed. And just uh, you know, uh, extract of uh, of uh, beer, whatever. You know, it's, it's, it's very straightforward. And the the point is that uh, the product could be with very high value because you tailor this uh, this product based on the requirements of the pathology. So, bacterial cellulose will be something easy to produce and straightforward to modify just in many ways you know we we make uh, uh bacterial cellulose just publish a, a paper with a uh, chitosan we just uh, uh put another one that just strain the, the film with silver nanoparticles so there are many ways it's it's uh, it's very straightforward to modify it, and the applications are very, very nice. So it depends on you and, and also it's cheap to produce. Of course, if you compare uh, plant cellulose, it's totally different uh, scale because, uh, you know, cellulose from plants just, just they are very, very cheap. However, the treatment of purifying bacterial cellulose, uh, plant cellulose is very expensive and also yeah. can be contaminated. In this case, bacterial cellulose is 99.9 .9 pure. So it's not immunogenic at all. Yeah. So why the query just now? Because when you mentioned about it can be grown using uh, agricultural waste, in yeah. Malaysia, we also have a lot of, uh, especially in the, in, in the state of Johor, where UTM is, UTM Jobaru is, we have a lot of uh, pineapple plantation around. Yeah, you have and, it. Yeah, you have we it have your own bacterial cellulose. <laughs> so, if so I, mean, I can go there and teach you how to do it. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so actually, uh, Guillermo, uh, uh, apart from uh, the Dr. Azila's group, we also have a, a group of researchers in this area in the faculty of science under the school of uh, bioscience and also under the uh, uh, school of biomedical engineering under the faculty of engineering and also we have some small group working with this also in school of oh. chemical engineering uh, in the department of bioprocess and also department of chemical yeah it means like we are yeah we are always uh, welcome to opportunities especially with uh, sure anytime research. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. very happy to, to start a new collaboration with you guys. I, you know, I mentioned to you that uh, after uh, two girls from the, the group of Asila stay in my lab for, I think, three months, 
and, and my stay in, in KL for, I think, uh, two weeks, we finished a paper. So we have uh, the chances to, 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 to do many things together. Yeah, great to hear that, Guillermo. For, for all participants, just want to share that uh, uh, we already have uh, existing collaboration with uh, uh, Guillermo Castro. And during 2017, we, we, we had two of our PhD students uh, attached to Guillermo Castro's lab for one month, right? One, three months. One month, three months in, in his lab in uh, La, La Plata. Oh, Santa Fe. La Plata, La Plata. La Plata. So just happy to share with you that they are both now graduated from their studies. They are both now doctors. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So nice. all of us, yeah. all of us are very much welcome to collaborate further with uh, Guillermo and also his uh, team of researchers over there. Yeah. So. Sure. Anytime. Yeah. Yeah, Guillermo. I just got a cue from the uh, coordinator that um, we might have come to the end of the session. Okay. Yeah. So with that, uh, since Professor Rafik has to attend another meeting, uh, okay. so he, he uh, sent his uh, utmost appreciation and grateful for for your uh, presence today and deliver your uh, sharing today as well as uh, personal from me also we are very grateful for you to be here and hopefully we can continue to have a uh, uh, further discussion about what we can do for the between our institutions okay yeah. sure yeah. Sure. yeah thank you very much for taking me for the lectures and i will be very happy to to stay in contact with you and, and the UTM people. Um, hopefully we can see each other very soon. Thank you very much for your kind invitation. Right, um, just uh, some final words from me. Uh, thank you Zainul for chairing the session. And thank you again to Professor William Castro for accepting our thank invitation. You. Zainal mentioned to me uh, the time right now in Argentina is somewhere around 11 p.m. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yes. All right. Okay. So, so there was a mistake, I guess, because when we mentioned uh, in our poster, 9 a.m. here in Malaysia is 8 p.m. in Argentina. So it is not. Yeah. It was 9. It's already 10 p.m. in Argentina. So you know, my my greatest uh, appreciation to you. Uh, for you know, for taking your time very late. No, please, it's my pleasure to to be in contact with you people. I I love Malaysia and uh, we have a very good collaboration and I hope we can continue that. It's, it's it is wonderful. Excellent, thank you so much. Very happy to hear thank that. You, Rafi. Thank you for the invitation. And, uh, to all thank our audience around the globe, thank you so much for watching UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, we have many more DLS series for you. Do stay tuned. Until then, bye for now. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.